let's let p be a prime number. If a and p are relatively prime, then Fermat's theorem says that a raised to the power p minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo p. Another way to say this is just if a isn't 0 modulo p, right, if p is prime. But now let's suppose that we want to try to look at the converse. Let's suppose that we didn't know that p was prime, p is just some number, but we did know that for every integer a relatively prime to p, we knew that a raised to the p minus 1 power were congruent to 1 modulo p. Would that be enough information to conclude that p is prime? To explore this, let's pick a number that's definitely not prime, like 561. That's 3 times 11 times 17. Now suppose I've got some number a, which is relatively prime to 561. So a is not a multiple of 3 or 11 or 17. Now despite the fact that 561 isn't prime, it still satisfies the conclusion of Fermat's law theorem. We're going to show that a raised to the power of 560 is congruent to 1 modulo 561. Now 3, 11, and 17 are prime numbers, and consequently by Fermat's law theorem, a squared is congruent to 1 modulo 3, a to the 10th power is congruent to 1 modulo 11, and a to the 16th power is congruent to 1 modulo 17. Now I'll take that first congruence, a squared is congruent to 1 modulo 3, and I'll raise both sides to the 40th power to conclude that a to the 80th power is congruent to 1 modulo 3. Now I can do the same thing with the next congruence. I can take a to the 10th is congruent to 1 modulo 11 and raise both sides to the 8th power to conclude that a to the 80th power is congruent to 1 modulo 11. And finally, I can take that last congruence, a to the 16th is congruent to 1 modulo 17, and I can raise both sides to the 5th power in order to conclude that a to the 80th power is congruent to 1 modulo 17. Now I glue them all together using the Chinese remainder theorem. So because I know that a to the 80th is 1 modulo 3, 11, and 17, I can conclude that a to the 80th power is 1 modulo 561. Ooh, I've got one more step here. I'm going to take a to the 80th congruent to 1 modulo 561. I'll raise both sides to the 7th power, and I find out that a to the 560th is congruent to 1 modulo 561. So despite the fact that 561 is not a prime number, it still satisfies the conclusion of Fermat's little theorem. So it's kind of a funny thing. From the point of view of uh, Fermat's little theorem, at least, the number 561, which isn't prime, definitely looks like it's a prime number. I mean, it's got the same kind of conclusion in Fermat's little theorem. If a is relatively prime to 561, that's enough to conclude that a to the 560th power is 1 modulo 561. So a challenge to you, can you find any other numbers with this property? So the property is the property of being a Carmichael number. What's, what does it mean to be a Carmichael number? Well, I say that a, a composite number n is a Carmichael number if it looks like it satisfies the conclusion of Fermat's law theorem. So that means that whenever a is relatively prime to n, then a to the n minus first power is congruent to 1 modulo n. Now, you have to be a little bit careful here because usually Fermat's law theorem is, is phrased as saying that uh, a is non-zero modulo p. And here we're just saying that a is relatively prime to n. Contrast the situation between Fermat's law theorem and Wilson's theorem. Wilson's theorem states that p is prime exactly when p minus 1 factorial is congruent to minus 1 modulo p. And it's quite a bit different than the situation with Fermat's law theorem. Right? The existence of Carmichael numbers right, is exactly because there are numbers which uh, fail to satisfy the hypothesis of Fermat's law theorem. They're not prime, and yet, suitably interpreted, they're satisfying the conclusion of Fermat's law theorem. Right? But with Wilson's theorem, we don't have this kind of phenomena. Right? We have an exact criterion for primality.